that I think the president has gotten a bum rap on, on job creation. And I, and I think it begs the question about what are the policies? And maybe you say, well, presidents don't create jobs. You know, that, that most may people be, believe that. Right. It's, well, most people believe that they do, right? Because that's what you get slammed Well, they get blamed for it and they get the credit. But if I they don't know stay, if they get the credit. If they, they do get the blame. If they stay out of the way, Governor, and let business do business, more jobs are created than having the government create the jobs. OK. Well, let's just say this. I, so let me ask you this. So you all applaud, and I agree that you've got to make sure that you don't have bureaucracy and you don't have government weighing people down, right? I totally agree with that. We had this philosophy in this country um, in the last century in particular, you know, of laissez-faire, of trickle-down, of hands-off, right? Um, but globalization happened. And now we have economic competitors that don't believe that and that are actively trying to recruit our businesses to their shores. And the question for us as a country is, what can we do? Are there circumstances where you can have partnerships? I mean, not, the government creates the environment for jobs, right? So yes, less bureaucracy. Oh. Yes, investment in But it, it works the other way, Governor. If there's more regulation, which is what happened in your state, regulation, higher taxes, then people don't want to hire people. Well, here's what I would say to this, is that if you don't have investment in universities, in talent, in infrastructure, in research and development, then you won't have job growth either. So clearly you've got to have competitive taxes and you've got to have, make sure that you do the investments to make sure those businesses are successful globally. And so that investment part is, is a key part of success. And so I think the president does not get the credit for strategic investments in saving aspects of our, our economy and in growing aspects of our economy. The auto industry is one strategic investment, but that was in the middle of a crisis. He's also really been um, very strong about investing in research and development. I mean, you're at this great university that is really focused on next generation technologies. But it's private. It, it this is, is but not the, a government handout. This is private. No, I know, but, I, and I'm not saying, that's great. But That's Washington great. gets no credit no, no, I, listen, for, for this. Okay, but you cannot leave everything to the private sector. You've got to have public universities that are great public universities Excellent. as well that also invest in research and development. You've got to have both. It's not either or, it's both and. And so you, you have to have those strategic investments. I mean, education, whether you're talking about kindergarten or universities, public education as much as you want to make sure the private sector and the private education options are there, but for many, public education is the only option. And public education is our way of saying that we believe in all of these children, whether we gave birth to them or not, whether they were born on you know, a tree-lined street in the richest part of, of Daytona or in a, a place of public housing. We are saying as, an, as a nation together that we want to make sure these kids have a chance, have an opportunity. And without that investment, you don't get that opportunity. So it's not a denigration of the private sector. And I don't, I don't want to take you away from the opportunity to talk about this jobs issue that you've created, because I want you to explain to the students and the yeah. general public here, and then I'm going to come back to a couple of things here. How did you come up with this idea? Was it based on what you were able to perform in Michigan, where you said, I'm going to take this to a grander scale once you left office? So what, uh, let me just explain what it is you're yes. talking about. Mark's talking about, um, I'm leading a research project at the University of California called the American Jobs Project. And it really is about this issue of how do we crack the code as a nation on keeping and creating particularly advanced manufacturing jobs in America when we've seen so much of globalization uh, lose our jobs to other countries. And um, part of it was, it was born of my experience you know, as governor of Michigan where we had such a concentration in one industry, which is the automotive industry, which was really in crisis and seeing so many jobs leave to go to other countries because it's so much cheaper to manufacture somewhere else and trying to think through what, what 
are the ingredients for us to actually, as a nation, maintain a really robust, advanced manufacturing sector. So can we go into the assumption, just among us, you're supporting former Secretary Clinton for president? I am. Um, can I? Come on, that? applause, yes! <laughs> see, see? Maybe it's just me. I knew there was a bunch of Republicans out there. I just wanted to give the Democrats yeah. some moment to applaud. We're, we're going to take questions from the audience, but <laughs> I got to ask you the big one. How are you going to get around Benghazi? Oh, come on. Are you serious? I'm serious. How many, how many studies have to be done to demonstrate that nothing on inappropriate happened? That there wasn't a, I mean, okay, you guys can all listen to this. Woo! Okay, wait, 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 wait. All right. Have you read the studies? I mean, I mean, how many independent studies have to happen to demonstrate that there was nothing inappropriate done? I mean, even the committee that was doing the investigation said the same thing. Now, I, I know that it's not a fact that some of you might want to hear, but that Benghazi thing, if that's all they got, bring it on, oh. baby. We're going to take questions. Let's take some people down here. Governor, thank you for not saying what difference does it make. <laughs> oh. <laughs> for Governor Granholm, right up front. Governor, thank you very much for coming tonight. And though I'm totally opposed to most of your views, I appreciate you coming and expressing <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to make a joke. No, no, well, that's I okay. To I totally to get it. The question is that you said that you got the federal government to block grant and allow you to, the uh, option to handle it the way you want to handle it. What president was that? Um, that was this president. Current president. Yes. I'm really surprised to hear that. I'm glad you did it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Right over here, your question for Governor Granholm. Yes, uh, Governor. Yes. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, seeing you're on Hillary's bandwagon, maybe you could list you're not? her, her accomplishments. No, no. <laughs> Never. Oh. <laughs> maybe list her accomplishments since being First Lady, uh, Senator, and then Speaker, and then Attorney General. Oh. Secretary of State? Yeah. yeah. Just for some of her, maybe the first 20 or something. What are the selling Oh my gosh, points? how much time do we have? Well, give, us what? A few, give us a few selling points, Governor. Well, okay, first of all, she would be the most experienced candidate to have ever run for president. She is somebody who has spent her life fighting for real people from the time that she was very early on, right out of law school. I mean, you're shaking your head I'm because you're in a different place. I get that. Who's your candidate? On the Republican side. She's been talking for 45 minutes and she doesn't have a plan of it. Ooh, she's going to get you. <laughs> the bottom line is um, she's, she hasn't decided that she's going to run yet. So she will come out with a platform, et cetera, about that. But her experience around the globe, her experience as a senator in fighting for manufacturing, which she was the, on the manufacturing caucus and completely a champion, her experience in fighting for the middle class. I mean, you can say, oh my goodness, give me a break. But she was, I can tell you, because I went and testified before her committee that she has been proposing things that help real people. To me, that's a really important criteria for the next president. I want somebody who's going to address this hollowing out of the middle class. I want somebody who's going to address the loss of jobs in the United States. I'm not saying the Republicans won't have a solution for that too. I'm sure that they will. But for me, what I have seen and what I've experienced with her, she, has, she will, I'm sure, have real solutions for what will help the US and not what will facilitate the continued offshoring of jobs to somewhere else. Can I ask you, have you seen the numbers from Iowa today? No. Elizabeth Warren is leading. In Iowa? Well, she's not running for-, for Right over here. She's not running. Are you okay with this, Common Core, by the way? I am. So we know you are. I am. It's, I am. Don't you think the jury's still oh, out? Oh, look at, come on, come on. They're not uh, wild about it. I know. Well, I mean, some people are not wild about it, and some people are wild about it. Maybe you got a majority of people who aren't wild about it here. Do you think but most you're at of this the university. Wait a second. I think this is what I think. I think that, that we have to realize in this country that we need to tell the young people that what was good enough for, for my parents is not going to be good enough for my children. 
that they have got to go beyond high school, whether that is in a technical or vocational training, whether that is in a community college or whether that's in a four-year university. We've got to tell them that in a global economy, if you want to have a good middle class job, you have got to get some kind of education beyond high school. And that's what Common Core was all about. In Michigan, when we went to the legislature to ask for it, we, the number of parents in Michigan who felt it was essential that their child go beyond high school was only 27%. And that's just, I mean, 27%, we were one of the lowest, um, we were in the bottom third of states with respect to kids who, or people who had college degrees. We have to have the full spectrum. So I agree with you entirely that we need to have technical and vocational options. And I also agree that we've got to exhort our kids to compete globally, and that means going to college. Right over here. Good evening. I wanted to know if you, you think our labor unions are going to evolve into something better than they are currently, and uh, how so? Well, I, I think our labor unions have devolved because there are so many, there's so many places where they have just sort of disappeared. Michigan, um, there's a huge diminution in labor participation. But here's what I do think, this is why your question is so great, because there are other models out there for labor that we should be looking at. So for example, in Germany, um, Germany invites workers to participate on the boards of companies. And Germany's done really well because of that insight and that participation. I think that a little bit of, a little bit less adversarial, a lot more working together to compete globally would go a long way in making us more competitive as a nation. Our labor laws right now are often very antiquated. I mean, they were, you know, designed in the 20s and they were designed under a very adversarial system. I think that we are in a position to be able to take another look at that and design labor laws that actually that help train. You know, in the auto industry, the, the prior head of the UAW, the United Auto Workers, was a guy named Bob King, and he was the president of the UAW when I was there. And he, he used to say to the UAW rank and file that this is not your father's UAW that we are changing to make these companies globally competitive, that we have to work with management to make them successful. If they're not successful, we're not successful. And so the UAW became the broker of great skill. So they wanted to be the, the place for training for these kind of jobs. That kind of model is a really great model. We need to take a look at it. So this is why your question is really smart. I think that there needs to be an evolution, but I do think that the ability to have labor unions is really important for the middle class, for there to be a middle class. You have to have an ability for workers to be able to upgrade their skills, to be able to work together. Because right now, this hollowing out of the middle class corresponds exactly with the decline in the labor movement. But there can be a new movement. 